Well, this week is our second week in a sermon series that I kicked off last week. We are in the book of Haggai. Now, if you don't know where that is, that's okay. Okay? I, I, a long, long time ago, I cheated and I put tabs on my Bible. Or on this Bible, anyhow. And that's about the only way I can find Haggai quickly. Okay, it's a, it's a very short book. The Bible I held up last week, it's one single page of paper. This week, it's two pages. I grabbed a different Bible this week. But it's a short, short little book, but an important and interesting little book. And I want to make sure that you get to, into this book, because not only are we going to be talking about it this week and the next two weeks, but this fall, we're going to be going through the book of Esther. And, and Haggai sets up the book of Esther fantastically well because they're overlapping time periods and talking about the same people from somewhat differing perspectives. And so it's, it's a worthwhile endeavor. If you missed last week, uh, go online, watch that first sermon because last week was a lot of the history, a lot of the background information, uh, a lot of the stuff that was going on. But I'm going to recap real quickly a little bit of what we talked about last week. So Haggai occurs roughly... 2,600 years ago, uh, and it has a whole lot of information and a whole lot of situations that are applicable and relevant to our life as a church still today. And as I said, go back and listen to last week's if you want to know more, but the, the story basically is the story of the Israelites. See, the Israelites, they have this up and down roller coaster cycle of following God and not following God, and following God and not following God. And as you read in the Old Testament, it's just up and down and up and down, and it's more down than it is up, but they occasionally do come up. And so what had happened was uh, they, they had been living in idolatry, and so God sends as his form of judgment uh, the Babylonians. The Babylonians come and take them captive, and they live in captivity for 50 years. But not only do they live in captivity, the Babylonians pick them up from Jerusalem, and they move them 900 miles away from Jerusalem, from the Holy Land, from this land that God had promised them. And so for 50 long years, they're living in Babylonian captivity. Well, the Persians come along, they conquer the Babylonians. And the Persians are a little bit more generous, I guess, if you will. And they look at the, the Jews in captivity and they say, you know, you really don't need to be here anymore. If you want to go back to Jerusalem, go on ahead. And so 50,000 of the Jews who were taken into Babylonian captivity do exactly that. And that's kind of the point where we picked up the story last week. So they get back to Jerusalem and, and God says, go back. Go back and rebuild my house. Go back and rebuild my temple. He gives them a job. He gives them a mission. He says, this, this is why I'm freeing you. I, I'm sending you back to go do this. So they get back to Jerusalem and they start to lay the foundation. Well, then a little bit of persecution happens. And they basically quit working on it. And instead, for the next 15 years, they spend all their time, money, money and energy building their own house instead of building God's house. And they lose their kingdom uh, priority. And so God has to send to them this prophet Haggai. Um, God sends them at this point after 15 years of not working on his temple. He sends Haggai to them and encourages them to rebuild the temple. And he essentially, essentially says to them, Folks, God did not ransom you from captivity so that you would return and live your life for the next 15 years building up your own name at the neglect of mine. And it's true, as we talked about last week, in the very same way, God has not ransomed us as Christ's followers. God has not freed us. He has not saved us from captivity to our sins so that we might spend the rest of our own lives living in our, as we saw last week, paneled homes, our fancy houses, building up our own personal kingdom, making our own name great, while His mission, while His, while his purposes they, they lie in ruin as the temple did. So God sends Haggai along to encourage them, get back to work. God is not done yet. He is with you in this thing, Haggai says. He is your God. He has not forsaken you. And, and so sure enough, what happens is that the Spirit begins to stir up in both the leaders, both in Joshua the high priest, as well as uh, Zerubbabel the governor. The, the Spirit begins to stir up in the people at this point, And they get fired up and repentance happens. And, and this repentance happens first in their hearts. Then their hands start to get involved. They get back to the work. They begin revering God once again. They begin heeding God's commands. And they get to work, start back in on building this temple that for the last 15 years they'd kind of been neglecting. So that brings us kind of to where we're going to kick off today. 
And what we're going to see today is that over the next month in our story, since this has occurred, the people have gotten back to work. Now the foundation has been laid. The walls are beginning to go up. And the people, most of them, are excited that, that, that they're starting to see things. But then, something, it, it, it derails this again. And that leads us to Haggai 2.1, if you want to follow along. If you don't have a Bible, there's some, in, some inside the lower levels of your chairs in front of you. There are Bibles on the Welcome Center. If you don't own a Bible, take that Bible with you from the Welcome Center home. It's our gift to you. Otherwise, if you've got a smartphone, uh, Uversion, uh, Bible.org is a great online tool uh, for reading the Bible. So Haggai 2.1 It says, In the seventh month, on the twenty-first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. And and so as I I was mentioning last week, um, this portion of the Bible, Haggai here, is the most detailed book we have in regard to exactly when it happened. Most books of the Bible, we have a general sense, a good idea of roughly when it happened. Haggai, on the other hand, we know like this was Tuesday. Right? Very specific when it happened. And in fact, uh, as scholars have gone back and dated this, they've said this is October 17th. Now, that's way smarter than me. I can't tell you how they did that. But somebody went and figured out October 17th is when Haggai 2.1 is taking off. This is roughly three and a half weeks after the people had repented in chapter 1. Three and a half weeks later, they've, they've gotten back to work, and they're working, and they're excited. And if you, if you know anything at all about the Jewish calendar, you'll, you'll know there's all these little uh, events. They call fests, right? Uh, different things throughout the year that they celebrate, that they remember. And this timing is very interesting when it comes to the Jewish calendar. Because the very next day would be the Feast of Tabernacles for Israel. Uh, Israel had several feasts that were, that were big feasts and feasts where God had called the people to, to remember Him each year. And each different feast uh, recognized a, a different aspect of God's faithfulness to the nation through various ways throughout their history. And, and the Feast of Tabernacle itself is, is a special celebration of, of kind of two different things, both physically and agriculturally. It's the grape harvest at this time of year. And so every year in the middle of October, uh, they would have this great grape harvest and they would celebrate with wine and and parties and just, you know, a great time of coming together and and remembering uh, God's goodness to them and and the the harvest. But even more importantly, the Feast of Tabernacles is also a celebration that God had instituted in the years following the Exodus. Uh, If you study the Old Testament, if you study the Jewish people, they are always looking back at this event. The Exodus is such a a, a looming historic event that's shaped all of Jewish culture for the time following. And so so this is in remembrance of of their liberation out of Egypt, that God had led His people through the wilderness, and therefore they set up this tabernacle where God was going to dwell there in the wilderness. And um, and, and they celebrated and they rejoiced this, this newfound freedom, this covenant that they had with God, this, 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 that God had lived up to His promises and led them into the promised land. And so God had mandated then, as a remembrance of this event every year, you have this Feast of Tabernacles. And what that means is that many of the Jews, and in fact all of the Jews, were supposed to be coming into the town, if at all possible, into Jerusalem. Uh, you normally would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate this event. You'd celebrate with others God's faithfulness to His people. And so this is an incredible time of celebration, or it should be at the very least. And at the same time now, God has stirred up in His people to rebuild the temple. They've had this new mission set forth in front of them. They get to restore this temple. And God is pleased with the, with the works of their hands. And, and it tells us that, that a harvest comes in. And if you, if you were here last week, you know God had actually sent a famine as part of His judgment when during those 15 years they quit working on the temple. God sent a famine to get their attention. And so now they really have cause to be celebrating. They're rejoicing. But yet, when we get to Haggai 2.2, uh, we see that God's got to send Haggai in again because we have a problem. In what should be this grand celebratory time, the nation has somehow become discouraged. Just three and a half weeks from their time of repentance, 
They're discouraged. Something has happened. It's robbed them of their joy. That has taken the joy out of the people. It's deflated their balloon. And they've gotten off track. And again, they're not working on the temple all of a sudden. So just let me ask you to kind of put on this, this lens as we go into these first nine chapters, or first nine verses of this chapter two of Haggai. Um, can, can you find yourself here in the midst of God doing amazing things among His people? God doing amazing things even perhaps in your life. Can you find yourself in this story as you're being obedient to God and following His promises? But in the middle of that, somehow, nonetheless, all of a sudden you're discouraged. Do you ever, you ever experience that? In the middle of what should be a celebratory time, you find yourself down, maybe, maybe doubting, maybe, maybe wondering, is what I'm doing here, is what I'm putting my hands here to, what I'm working on, is this really even worth my time and my effort? Can that happen to us? Absolutely. It can happen to us. It happened to the Israelites and it can happen to us today. So let's see what God has to say to the people here. Haggai 2.2 2. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all of the remnant of the people and say, and here's the question that Haggai poses to the nation. Now this question comes in verse 3. We find out exactly what was discouraging them. And it's a rhetorical question in Scripture here. Haggai says, Who is left among you who saw this house, who saw this temple that you were bidding? Who, who is left among you that saw the temple in its former glory? Haggai comes in and says, Okay, folks, by a show of hands, you know, there's 50,000 people there. By a show of hands, how many of you were still here, you know, now almost 70 years ago? How many of you were here to see Solomon's temple. This was one of the wonders of the world, folks. An amazing thing to behold. And Haggai's saying, how many of you got to see this, this, this amazing thing? Who's left that saw the temple in its glory? And then his next question is, how do you see it now? You saw it before, how do you see it now? Is it as nothing in your eyes? You see, what had happened in the story here is that the nation began to work and they get the foundation laid and the stones are going up. And there's some older men and women who are working and, and all of a sudden they start conjuring up images of old. They start remembering the previous temple and they're going, hold on, wait a minute. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't look like the old temple, right? Right? This, this isn't as nice as what we had before. In fact, this kind of looks like a trash heap. This thing's a shack compared to Solomon's place, right? His thing was tricked out. It was laced with beautiful jewels and gold and decorated all over the place. Now it's just laying in rubble and it's, a, it's an ugly mess. And all we're doing is slapping some mortar on it and sticking some bricks back together and... That just doesn't look good at all. And instantly, we see in the story, this older generation begins to weep because they start thinking to themselves, this is never going to be as good as what we used to have. You ever been in a place like that? You ever been there? You ever been in that place where that discouragement creeps in? So imagine this story. We have half of the group, they've never seen the old temple, and something's starting to go up. And they're excited. We are finally doing God's work. We're finally building something. It's going up, man. This is awesome. Then you got the other group going, this thing's a pile of junk. What are we doing here? Why are we wasting our time on this? Right? I'm not sure I can get behind this. So listen to what Ezra has to say about this. Because Ezra also overlaps in this story. Ezra 3, 12 through 13. It says, But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses and the old men who had seen the first house, the, the old temple, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many others shouted aloud for joy. So the people 
around them, surrounding them, could not distinguish the sound of the joyful sound, joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard from far away. So like I said, you have, you, you got the older folks, they're kind of having these flashbacks to the old temple, and the younger folks are celebrating the new temple, and they're both yelling, some for joy and some with wailing, and nobody can tell who's doing what, right? The young folks, they got nothing to compare the temple to, and they see God at work. They know that God has released them and freed them from captivity to go and build up this temple. That, 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 that this temple where Yahweh once had His glory is going to be restored and will be there again, right? And so they're excited. But you have the other camp going, man, Solomon's temple was awesome. That, that really made much of God. It was a beautiful thing to behold. When, when people would come from other nations, they would see that, you no, know, our God is better than their God. And they should worship our God. And this new one we're building, I don't know. I don't think people are going to be so awed and wowed by it. So you got weeping and shouting for joy simultaneously. Can you imagine that scene? Even the surrounding communities didn't know what was going on. Ezra will go on to indicate that the older generation in their despair and in their discouragement, they begin to allow that to turn into bitterness. It takes root in their heart and, and it begins to seep into them. And, and, and as this bitterness enters in, as bitterness often does, it begins to spread, right? And so this bitterness from the older generation slowly begins to rob the joy from the younger generation. And all of a sudden we find ourselves where the whole nation, again, has quit working on the temple. So once again, God's got to send Haggai back in to try to lift their spirits again. Have you ever been in that spot? You've worked hard, you've invested in something, you've put a ton of work and energy in it, only to be discouraged when you look up and maybe you see that guy across town built a bigger, better, faster thing. Right? You're like, man, I did all this work, but... They're selling twice as many widgets as we do. Right? You ever, you ever been to that point where, where you're kind of looking in that rear view mirror, thinking, the things now are never going to be as good as those things that we just passed. I think we've all been there, haven't we? And what you have here with Israel is, is two primary issues in the text. The first one is they had allowed, and this is in your notes, they had allowed the rear view mirror to dictate the front window. How dangerous would it be if you drove around all the time looking at nothing but your rear view mirror? That might even be worse than texting, right? <laughs> See, they had spent so much time looking back that they had neglected God's promises for their future. So that led to their discouragement. And the second problem is they had allowed their discouragement to turn into bitterness, which then turned into criticism, which then turned into gossip, which then turned into slander, and then it spread throughout their community. And those who were joyous, those who were thankful for what the Lord was doing, found themselves being discouraged. Thinking, well, man, if, if they're discouraged and unhappy about this, can God really be in it? So all of a sudden, you have this, this issue spreading out, right? It just takes a little leaven to leaven the whole loaf. You've heard that, right? It begins to spread and multiply. Could something like that happen to us? Could that happen to us here today? Could that happen in our community? Could that happen in our church? When it gets to the point where you're looking backwards... So much so that you're no longer looking forward as a church. You're in trouble. In fact, if we ever get to that point, and hopefully you will hold us accountable to this, if, if you ever feel like we're at a point where, where maybe me up here on stage or any of our, our leadership, if, if you feel like we are not looking forward and we're only looking backwards, you better warn us. Otherwise, stick a fork in us because we're done. Because oftentimes, by the time somebody realizes we've reached that point, it's almost too late to turn that ship. And I've seen 
churches with incredible histories that have done amazing things over years and over time. They go and they, they reach a plateau and then they start looking back and they start to decline and they just keep looking back because what they saw behind them looked better than what they think is before them. And that turns into a, just a, a nosedive and eventually leads to the end of what was once great churches. And I don't want that to happen. I don't believe that it's happening, so don't hear that. But I don't want that to happen. We need to hang on to the promises of God. Focus on the mission that's before us. And be careful of looking back and going, that's not how we used to do it. Or back in my day, right? The good old days, that's not what we want. Now, I also want to say, in the midst of saying all of this, there's nothing wrong with looking back. Okay? All throughout Israel's history, that's what these feasts and festivals are about. They had stones of remembrance, times that were intentionally built into their calendar to look back to the faithfulness of God. So I'm not saying we can't look back. We should look back. But looking back should encourage us to continue on forward in the promises of God's faithfulness and His mission before us. And at this time, it was supposed to be a celebratory time in the life of Israel. But instead, they kind of found themselves stuck in reverse. Looking backwards, saying, it's never going to be as good as it used to be, right? And we have to all be careful of that. Every single one of us. The mission of the church, the forward movement of the church, was best described by the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3. He writes this. He says, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in God through Christ Jesus. And then he concludes that passage by saying, Let those of us who are mature think that way. And that's the idea of, of maturity in the church. The church isn't caught up in what happened in 1970, but it's thinking about what God intends to do in the community among us and through us and what is yet to come. Where does God want to take us? So one of the problems that the church can face, and some are obviously facing even in this day, is that temptation to neglect the promises of God, neglect the current activity of God, and to stay focused on what was in the rearview mirror. And as I said, the, the second problem that Haggai brings forth is that this bitterness comes. And when this discouragement turns into bitterness, it begins to take root in their hearts. And that bitterness begins to move outwardly. Instead of just going to the Lord with this worry that what we're building here isn't going to be as good as what we used to have, Instead of going to God saying, God, I need some encouragement. I need to see why you're having us do this because, man, right now, I'm not, sure this, I'm not sure about this new temple. I'm not even sure this is worth our time. Instead of doing that, they started going to one another going, huh, I, don't, I don't think this is a good thing. Right? Instead of going to God, they started mumbling and grumbling and rumbling. Right? And then, then the younger generation starts to hear those whispers. And the doubt begins to creep in into their hearts as well. And what happens is, the people of God find themselves just stuck in neutral, doing nothing. And so when that begins to happen, we have to be intentional. We have to choose to fight against that. We have to believe that God can and will do greater things. And then we have to together work towards that faithfully. Because this is my experience. Self-focused complaining it can spread like cancer in any organization. I've been the root of that at times myself. I know. When I start looking at me and saying, I want it this way, I want it this way, I want it this way, my, 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 me, 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 I, I, I. It's often, most often, almost always, to the detriment of the we. And I've been there. I've been the whiner. I've been the complainer. I repent. I repent. Our mission is bigger than any one of us. God's plans are higher than, and greater than anything any one of us could even imagine. And that needs to be our focus. Not whether I get my way here or there. Not whether back in my day or when I was at this other church. No. 
I believe, folks. I believe to the core of my being that the greatest days for us are yet to come. The greatest days for you, for me, for this church are yet to come. I believe it. And I want you to believe it too. I believe God is doing something amazing, an amazing and great work. I can tell you all kinds of statistics. I can pull up all kinds of facts. I can tell you how much our high school youth group has grown. I can tell you we got 17 baptisms coming this summer. How many remember any time in our past where we ever had 17 baptisms all at once? Amen. Praise the Lord. Right? I can tell you about how many hits we get on our website, how many people watch a sermon, how many visitors we have. That doesn't matter. What I want is for you just to believe that God is doing something amazing and He will continue doing something amazing in and with and through us if we're just willing. If we're just willing to be part of it, folks. I believe. Do you? God's goal for His people is not that, uh, that they would be living out what happened 50 years ago, right? But that we would be living in the promises that He has for us and for our future. So even though these folks had this perception that the temple would never measure up, right? Would never be as good as what they had. What God wanted them to do is keep working. Not to have dissension, not to pull people away, but to keep working and trust in what he was doing. Now let me tell you why I think one of the root issues behind both of these problems is what happens is we begin to worship the wrong thing. We begin to worship the form rather than the function. You see, the function of the church, the function of the people of God is simply this, that we would glorify God above all else. That we would be faithful as God's people to make disciples as He's commanded us to. That we would recognize that we are in the ministry of reconciliation as God is reconciling all things to Himself that you and I as Christ followers, as His saved people, as His church, that we get to be part of that. We get to serve that mission. We get to be on the front lines, folks of life change, of transformation, of eternity change. That's the function of the church. Now the forms of the church are the vehicles that help drive that function. The forms are things that should and do change from time to time. Things like the programs we use. How we might decorate the church. The the order of our worship service, for instance. Something like that. Uh, What songs we sing. When we lock onto a form... We do so at the expense of the function. And it slowly can take us off track. And when this happens, it becomes difficult to move forward because we're so hung up on the the forms of old. And so here in this story, we have a nation that's frozen now because they've allowed this discouragement to settle into their hearts and they're not trusting in God's promises. So when this happens, what do you do? What does God have to say when we find ourselves in those moments, when we, we feel like, yeah, we're not moving forward? What do we do when we have those moments of discouragement? So along comes Haggai, Haggai 2.4. It says, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. God is telling them, be strong, right? Literally translated, take courage. It's the same message he gave them last week in Haggai 1. Take courage and get to work because I am with you. God says, I don't associate myself with things that I'm not interested in being involved with. I'm with you. I'm in on this. I will not abandon you. I'm going before you. Come with me. And when you do that, you don't have to be afraid, God says. So fear not. 
He says, you've got nothing to be afraid of in this work because I am Yahweh. I am God. I am the creator of all things. I am the redeemer and I am on your side in this. So he gives an encouragement to his people. And God says here to those who are discouraged the same thing that he had said two months earlier. Take courage because I am with you. But what's interesting this time is, is, and it's different than in chapter 1, is what he says in verse 5. He says, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. And what's interesting in this is that, that Haggai uses this Exodus account to, to back up the promises of God to his people. Reminding them of the freedom that he was given to his people. The freedom out of slavery. Reminding them of all the miraculous works that God had done. No man could go and part the Red Sea. It had to be a miracle. God was in it. And only the maker of heaven and earth could do that. And if that same God was in it, and that same God made that promise, and that same God set them free, and He's saying to these folks, these Jews, who all remember those stories, who've been told those stories all of their lives, He's saying, that very same God is with you and is with me. That same God who made those promises is still promising today. So take courage. Don't be afraid. Be part of God's kingdom work. And I would say just as then, we need to hear that today. For you and I who who serve faithfully, trying to allow the, the Holy Spirit to use us to help build up His church, right? We're trying to reach out to the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet, in the midst of that, sometimes we do feel discouraged. Sometimes it's like, man, this is hard being a Christian, right? Sometimes it's a struggle to share our faith with others. Sometimes maybe we even have doubts, right? You go, man, this is hard. But in that moment, God says to you and says to me, I am the one who liberated you. If anybody is for my plan, it's me. I am with you. So don't look at your circumstances now. Don't allow that to dictate whether you do or don't obey. Look to the promises I have set before you. That is your hope. Now get to work. That's what God says to us. One last bit of encouragement, and we'll wrap up here. Probably the biggest one that we need to hear comes in verses 6 through 9. God will give one more reason for His people to be, re- be encouraged in their rebuilding efforts. And He's going to essentially tell them this. He's going to tell them that the temple that you're building, even though it seems like nothing at the moment, I have some pretty important plans for this. I have some big plans for this. I have plans so big for this temple that you are building, even though you can't see it. I have some grand plans that are so great, it's going to make Solomon's temple seem like an ant mound. God is going to put before them His ultimate purposes for their work, for the work, what their work is going to accomplish. And that is their reason for hope. He says this in 6-9, through nine, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver, it's mine. The gold, it's mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than its former. So what is coming is going to be greater than the past, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord. So God is telling them, something amazing is coming. You can't see it. This work that you're building into right now, you can't see it. But something amazing is going to happen. It's going to be totally worth your effort. You're not pouring your effort in for vain. Haggai gives what's called a a progressive or a dual revelation. He tells them about some things that are going to happen now in the immediate future, but things that are also going to come down the road in the final days. So... Haggai is telling them, yes, this temple we're building is significant now. But this temple that we're building is going to be even greater. Because here's the secret in this temple, folks. We know this in New Testament believers. This is the temple that Jesus will stand in. This is the temple in like 500 years 
that that little boy Jesus is going to be found sitting at the feet of people learning when his parents come back looking for him. This is the temple where Jesus is going to drive the money changers out of. This is the temple where Jesus is going to be put on trial before his sentence for death. Ensuing, of course, then the resurrection. This is that same temple. So this temple is significant, far beyond what they could know at that time. This temple mattered. So this was that temple. And what Haggai is doing here is he's trying to get them back on track. Trying to tell them that their work will transcend their time. Remember what Jesus said? He said, you can tear down this temple, right? And in three days I'll build it back up again. Jesus wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about himself. He says, I am the real temple. We are working and building into that temple today still. He says, we are working for the glory of God. The glory of God doesn't reside in an ark. Jesus says, I am the glory of God. I am the manifestation of God. So though you might tear it down, I'm going to resurrect it in three days. It was the corresponding scripture in Ezekiel and Hebrews and 1 Thessalonians as well as Revelation that tell us all about this. And so when we work and when we build, our vision has to be greater. Because we can't even see the temple today, right? The temple today, if you go to the Temple of the Rock in in Jerusalem, there's only one wall standing. And on top of that, a mosque. It's, It's a Muslim holy site, right? The temple we are building is into Jesus. And that is where we find our hope. Do not become discouraged. When it feels like maybe you're pouring into something and you're working hard. And sometimes working in a church is that way. When you're working with a young one, you may not see that instant change in their life. When you're sharing your faith with your neighbor, they may not just fall down on their knees and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But keep working. God is building. Don't let discouragement creep in. Don't let self-focus get you off track. You see, folks, we're all in this together. God's desire is that we would be unified and working and pulling in the same direction for His glory in all things. And that is the function of the church. That is what we are to be about. That is what Haggai was trying to get their attention and set them back on the right track. And God is calling all of us to keep moving forward. Even when we don't see the bigger picture, we know the bigger God. Trust Him and keep investing in His work. Keep moving forward in obedience, trusting Him in the promises that He's given, that He will fulfill them. Amen? Let's pray.